Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everybody. You have to talk right into the mic. I'm afraid of the mic. Uh, this summer in August, my wife and I were uh, visiting Washington, D.C. for a couple of days, and one of the things that we visited was the Lincoln Memorial. And on the Lincoln Memorial, if you've been there, on the North Wall, they have inscribed the words of the Gettysburg Address. And even though I'd heard of the Gettysburg Address before, I didn't know really much about it. So when we got home, I did some studying on it, I Googled it, and I found out that there were actually two Gettysburg addresses. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. Because tomorrow, November 19th, is the actual anniversary date, the 156th anniversary of President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So this is the story of the two Gettysburg Addresses. On uh, November 19, 1863, at the dedication of a Union military cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania during the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln delivered one of the shortest and most memorable speeches in American history. But he wasn't the primary speaker that day. That role was reserved, I'm sorry, was reserved for another well-known statesman. So we need to look at some history surrounding what happened there. By the year 1861, our country of 34 states had grown deeply divided politically and morally over slavery, equality, states' rights, and the secession movement of the Confederate states in 1860 and 1861. The Civil War commenced in 1861 and would rage on for four years. Now we jump to year 1863. In the latter part of June 1863, a large Confederate army invaded the North as far as the small town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where the Union forces of the North were already present. On July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg was fought. It was the single bloodiest battle of the Civil War. Over the course of those three days, more than 7,500 men lost their lives, and an additional 45,000 men were wounded, captured, or missing. But the battle proved to be the turning point of the war. General Robert E. Lee's defeat and retreat from Gettysburg marked the last Confederate invasion of the Northern Territory, the beginning of the Southern Army's ultimate decline and the eventual surrender in 1865. In the summer heat after the Gettysburg Battle, Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin faced a pressing need to identify and bury the dead. But he also felt compelled to give meaning to the bloody tragedy, tragedy and hope to the future. Curtin enlisted the help of a leading Gettysburg citizen, attorney David Wells, who immediately <coughs> acquired 17 acres for a battlefield cemetery and began planning for its dedication ceremony. Looking for a speaker who could, with, in his words, artful words, sweeten the poisoned air of Gettysburg, Wells turned not to Mr. Lincoln, but to the obvious choice, Edward, Edward Everett from Boston, who had long been recognized for his eloquent and graceful use of language, his musical voice, and magnetic presence. Almost as an afterthought, Wells also sent a letter to President Lincoln just two weeks before the ceremony, requesting a few appropriate remarks to consecrate the grounds. In the weeks before the dedication, Mr. Everett researched every aspect of the three-day battle. At the dedication ceremony on November 19, 1863, four and a half months after the battle, the crowd of 15,000 listened intently for two hours as Everett, from memory, we lived the battle step by awful step. Many in the crowd were moved to tears. Then Lincoln rose to speak. Unlike Everett, he did not relive the battle. In fact, he never mentioned Gettysburg, the Union, or slavery. Instead, the president reached beyond the battlefield and called up a new nation out of the blood and trauma. 
Mr. Everett was quick to acknowledge the greatness of Lincoln's brief speech. The day after the ceremony, he wrote the following to the president. I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. Lincoln sent an immediate and gracious <coughs> response. In our respective parts yesterday, you could not have been excused to make a short address, nor I a long one. I am pleased to know that, in your judgment, the little that I did say was not entirely a failure. In the years since then, Mr. Everett's speech has become known as the other Gettysburg Address. When President Lincoln took the podium on that day at Gettysburg, he spoke these words which have become known as the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth in this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come here to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do so. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion. That we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. And now you know the story of the two Gettysburg Addresses.